Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration and collaboration creates community and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. Well, welcome to Face to Face on this beautiful sunny day here in uh, Toronto and I think in Chicago as well. Uh, our guest today is Gabe Fajuri. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, Gabe. Hey there, David. Thanks for having me. It, and is it truly beautiful and sunny in Chicago today? 80 and sunny. 80 and sunny. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, that doesn't translate into much. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Can you give, give us so. that in Canadian? I, I can't actually. <laughs> that's right. I think that's probably. Uh, I don't even know if I can give it to you in Canadian. Maybe twenty-four degrees, twenty-five degrees. I'm not sure. It's yeah. really nice. It's really nice. That's perfect. Uh, Gabe is Gabe is an interesting guy. He's uh, uh, according to a website that I came across, the, uh, the world's foremo- one of the world's foremost uh, magic scholars. He is an author. He's a uh, editor of a several periodicals and magazines. He's been writing essays on the history of magic for many, many years. He's also a magician. You can actually uh, find him online. Um, and oh, in fact, God. I know. I found, Gabe, I found a YouTube video where they actually refer to you as a dashing young man. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, I know. It's a bit troubling. Um, <laughs> Me, most of all. <laughs> that's right. But you know what? The magic you did was great, and it was to promote uh, one of your books, which uh, I'm oh, sure yeah. your, um, uh, was it your Man of Many Mysteries book, maybe? or uh, I think it was an instructional book, uh, Mysterio's Encyclopedia. Mysterio's, Mr. Mysterio, which I hope we're going to talk about uh, a little bit okay. today. And and I think the thing that uh, uh, really interested me, Gabe, about, about connecting on face-to-face and just having a chat was your, your life as an auctioneer. So you've okay. got this really interesting eclectic background that seems really disconnected, frankly. But mm-hmm. I bet you there's some pretty intimate links along the way, and I'd love to talk about some of those connections. But uh, yeah, well, so 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 tell me about magic scholarship. I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, magic is about card tricks and coin tricks and dancing girls and 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 vanishing lear jets. What what? Why would you need to be a magic scholar, or why does magic even need scholarship? Um, well, I suppose it has to do with whether or not you consider it an art form, um, and I we won't get into that debate, but. You know, like the history of any performing art, I think that there's room to study what it's all about and where it all came from. And uh, the, the stories of the people that are involved in it are what fascinate me as much, if not more, than the tricks themselves. So that's where my interest in, in the subject are- so, so online uh, listeners or I or anyone could see you doing some magic online, and it looks to me like you got some chops there, Gabe. But you're not a oh, no. performer in that sense, are you? You're more of a you're a guy behind the scenes. Yeah, the the video should be excised from <laughs> YouTube and, and your memory, but um, <laughs> right. you're, you're very kind. Um, well, you're no, quite I, uh, you are quite dashing. I will say that. Oh well, you. And write my bio if you like. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, no, I just, you know, I, I'm interested in the human story, and I think that, you know, wasn't it Dale Carnegie who said that, you know, people are most interested in other people, and it just so happens that, you know, you're talking about connecting threads, and so magic is the connecting thread, you know, and uh, so to find out about what make, makes these people interesting, what drew them to magic, and then the kind of things they were doing, that's what interests me. Is there a sense that, um, are, are you kind of, would you say, Gabe, living out a, uh, are you living your life sort of vicariously or voyeuristically, I suppose, in a way, through some of these old vaudevillians, through some of this history and some of these performers? I mean, I know many times I've sat in a theater and I'll watch a show or uh, could be a play, could be a magic show, and I'll just look around at the theater and elbow my wife and, you know, Elizabeth is, oh, I'd so love to work on this stage. You know, and you just, you just have that feeling, and there's like this stage or this theatrical buzz, and you know what's going on behind the scenes, and you, you kind of want to be a part of it. Is Would you say that's where you're at? i say that's part of it. Um, I'd say that the way that I get to live vicariously is through 
the auction business is through handling all the things that they used to own or maybe they signed or maybe that advertised their shows, you know, so that because I couldn't be there to see those things in action, that I get to, you know, kind of read a history book every day. Um, and you get to imagine what it might have been like and, you know, handle the things that they did. And, well, to, and, and Gabe, who, who, are, who are they? I mean, you've... you've... They, they would be pe- uh, people like Harry Houdini, of course. Um, you know, we've sold a lot of personal uh, papers that he owned and some of, the, some of the handcuffs and escape things that he's used. So cool. Um, and then, you know, the, the list of recognizable people from the past falls off pretty quickly as far as Interesting. magicians are concerned. But, you know, as far as Canada goes, uh, Di Vernon, we sold many of the personal items from his, uh, his estate. Um, we've sold many things owned and used by his contemporaries, uh, Cardini, and uh, a few Max Molini items. Of course, Howard Thurston, Dante, Keller, the, the list goes on and yeah. on and on. So it's really interesting, you know, that you comment there about the uh, the 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 recognizable list falls off rather quickly. I'm mm-hmm. I'm actually reading a book right now, which I'm sure you've read or are about to read. Stein, uh, Jim Steinmeier, um, the was it the last greatest magician in the world? Sure, and about, yeah, great book. A, a, it is a great book. Loving every minute of it, actually. And I think part of the reason I asked you that question is because I actually f- I see myself, I find myself in some of those settings and some of those theaters and the mm-hmm. you know the hookups and the wiring and the things that are going on. Um, nobody knows who Howard Thurston is. No, well, very few. People very few right. people. And so uh, Vernon, who's that? Cardini, never heard of him. Molini, Dante Keller. I mean, who are these people? And and mm-hmm. and you've written a book about a guy, I believe, by the name of Laurent. Yes. Yeah, a yeah, very small time in comparison to any of the people on the list you just went through. Right, and yet, even the list I just went through, very few people have heard of. Why, why is that? I mean, would these would these guys be TV stars today? Um, was it because they didn't have social media? Why is it that Houdini has, beca- has become this household name and these others haven't? Um, probably because that's what he was great at, was generating publicity. There's some mystique around his death. Um, you know, he just hit all the high points. Would some of these guys be TV stars today? Yeah, I think so. Minor, possibly, TV stars. <laughs> Minor, uh, right. You know, but a lot of these guys were operating in an era before television. Sure. Uh, you know, and, but you know, Thurston's show was billed as a national necessity. He was wow, what a great mind. Yeah. Exceptionally popular, and uh, it was a profitable show, and people took their kids back year after year after year after year. You know, it was... It was a big going concern, and Keller, you know, was the guy he he um, succeeded basically in that in that role, I suppose. So, would they be celebrities today? Yeah, I mean, they would be known quantities. They might not be Stephen Colbert, right? But um, they would certainly be a part of the galaxy of stars. I'd love to chat a little bit about the, that whole magic thing, and with my background and so on. We don't have to get into the art discussion. We'll save that for another time. But there is something profoundly. I think interesting and fascinating about taking a coin and, and vanishing it, and mm-hmm. even even in this age of social media and film and so on and 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 special effect and digital and the the whole avatar James Cameron kind of a thing. You know, I did a performance the other night for the first time in several years, and I mm-hmm. did. And, you know, one of the strongest things I did was a pure sleight of hand piece with four, uh, you know three balls that vanished from my hands and, and into my pockets and so on. And and the the response was was brilliant. You know, twenty five people in the audience and they really found it magical and yet on another level they probably knew how it was done you know sort of Mm -hmm. they knew the mechanics Mm -hmm. so uh, it to me i find that really fascinating that we're still kind of drawn in by that even in this day and age not quite the golden age anymore Uh, there's probably more magic now than there ever has been oh really Uh, how how, how so it's just different you know i think there are probably more magicians there's probably more magic available to people if they seek it out. Um, you know, so we don't have vaudeville theaters anymore. Well, styles change and tastes change and, you know, but I, I would imagine I'm not far off, you know, by saying that uh, there's more magic available now than, than ever before. Certainly in the industry of magic, you know, uh, there's more available to people who are interested in it than there ever has been. Um, you know, I, who would have thought that I could have opened an auction business that specializes, I mean, in, really, it's our specialty in magic tricks and magic memorabilia, you know, antiques. 
strictly related to that subject. Um, you know, clearly there's a market where one didn't really exist before. And are you getting rich beyond your wildest dreams doing it? I am making a living. <laughs> yeah. It really is quite fascinating in a way. I mean, it's very social. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's entrepreneurial of you for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to see, um, I mean, I've always known about the collectors and, you know, I collected stamps as a kid and the coins mm -hmm. and, and I've always been fascinated, I suppose, by magic collectors, but, uh, but never really had the, I guess, the time or the money for it, really. I've always been drawn towards some of the posters from the age and so on, and, and, uh, but it really is quite remarkable. I've followed some of your auctions online, and I'm, I'm blown away by, by, by the interest and by, by what people are willing to pay for some of these items. You know, we sell everything from $25 lots to $25,000 lots to last year we had uh, Cardini's Tuxedo, which we sold for $72,000 <laughs> oh, for an, uh, literally an unknown magician. I mean, unknown today, unknown magician, although he was quite popular in his day. That's a lot of money for a guy's tuxedo. Now, th now he would be very well known in the community, though, right? Like the magic. Oh, yeah, yeah, top ten. Yeah, top ten. Yeah, exactly. Maybe top five. Yeah. Yeah, and so would people who are buying this stuff are they are these museum? Uh, 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 gee, I can't think of the name. Curators, or would these just be um, folks who want to show off uh, their brilliant collection? It's everybody from farmers to bankers to uh, institutions to private collectors to performers. Um, you know, certain researchers and people interested in information will buy rare books from us. So. You know, it kind of runs the gamut. Do you find, uh, Gabe, that, that these folks are the, um, hmm, um, are not the doers? They're the uh, No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I, it does really run the gamut. I mean, I, and, you know, I know that uh, one of your main interests, interests is, you know, philanthropy, philanthropy, pardon me. Yes. Um, the, the guy who bought the tuxedo ended up uh, putting that and all the other material he bought on display at the Magic Castle in an exhibit basically a permanent exhibit. It wasn't really for the hmm. glory or to put it in a lighted showcase in his house. He wanted to share it with other people and make oh. sure that they knew who Cardini was. Cool. So kind of like, uh, you know, uh, helping, not, not creating the legacy, but actually just moving it forward. Maintaining it. Maintaining you know, he it. hired an exhibit design company, and it's really a beautiful, beautiful setup there at the castle. Yeah. What, what what so what is it that draws people in? Why were these guys national necessities? Why you know <laughs> you know what the heck do we just like being fooled? Do you think? I mean, I, I you know as a magician, yeah. I know I what I like about it. Obviously, you know I like I think and you know what's interesting too, Gabe. For me, is as I get older, I think I'm more uh, comfortable or even more um, satisfied working on an effect than I am actually performing it for an audience. Mm. If that makes sense. I don't know. I mean, superhero movies are more popular than they ever have been. Maybe it has something to do with... Saw the, saw the X-Men last night, Days of Future Past. I heard it was great. It's a lot of fun. Talk about a reboot. Holy cow. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah, they're hard at it. I mean, they're... I tell you, Marvel is just changing the, changing the world from the inside out, man. It's really? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Okay. Right. I'll yeah. check it out. Yeah, pretty fun. Um... I don't know. I think it's you know. So part of the part of it is you know the superpower kind of aspect of it. The I can do this. You can't do that. Of course, is, is possibly part of it. Um, the the philosophical way to look at it would be about you know wanting to wonder, wonder, you know, like yep. wonder, um, which is really hard to get from most anything. I, I think that you know there's a disconnect. Talk about X Men. Well, yeah, it's a comic book, or yeah, it's a movie, but this is really happening. This this magic trick, this thing happened right in front of my face. Right, right. You know, wait a minute. No, you know that was just in my hand. You know that was just in my hand. You know, I can't believe it. So it's a real, still a tangible experience. Which, you know, I mean, maybe someday we'll get there with technology, but. I don't know. It's going to be hard to supplant that with something else. Well, I remember, uh, you probably remember this better than I do. You could probably quote the page. But didn't Downs say in something that he wrote, uh, T. Nelson Downs, he was a, a famous coin magician and manipulator, and he said something about um, um, that once we get, once technology gets to a certain point, you know, magic will no longer be relevant? Well, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said that um, any sufficiently advanced form of technology... And I, I'm getting this wrong, 
any sufficiently advanced form of technology is the equivalent of magic. Right. Something like that. Something like that, yeah. 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 Which sort of sounds like an extension of what Downs was saying. I, yeah, I might, and I might be bringing the two together, but, uh, mm-hmm. but the idea being that once we get to the Avatar, like um, James Cameron special effects, why would you want to see a coin trick? Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll get there. I think in our lifetimes we'll get real close. Um, but, you know, we're almost there now. We are kind know, of almost but, there. I don't know about you, but I just talked to my phone yesterday and asked it for directions, and then it talked back to me. <laughs> right. Did it, have a, did it have an attitude, Gabe, or? It did not. Okay. Try asking your iPhone how much wood, wood, woodchuck could chuck and see what kind of answer you get. Right, right. I can imagine. Yeah. I'm actually not kidding. Maybe they built in answers to that. Oh, they really? Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Okay, some Pretty people fun. just have way too much time on their hands. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, so do you ever find yourself um, wishing that you performed uh, more? or yeah. maybe You do, eh? So you, sure. Yeah? Did you spend a lot of time on stage? I found somewhere online that you, uh, you know, in your bio somewhere that you kind of started out like most magicians doing kids' parties. Um, yeah, all that stuff. I did some little TV show for kids and, you know, worked in restaurants and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, the, my problem was uh, I wasn't really looking for an ego stroke, you know, so it wasn't a big thing for me to be in front of people and get applause, and, you know, that didn't feed me. I wasn't very good at marketing myself to get more gigs. I just like doing magic tricks. Yeah, yeah. So I did it a little bit here and there all the way through college, but basically came to the conclusion that, you know what, leave it to the pros. I I, I love this stuff, no question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stick with the thing that I'm really focused on, which is the history and collecting and studying and, you know, writing about it. And since I'd enjoyed writing, since basically I was, you know, 10 years old, right. it was a natural but unplanned uh, marriage of two, two interests. So no, no, uh, no plans to go out on the street anytime soon? Uh, you know, I don't really know anybody who's making a living on the street. I suppose, I suppose, I suppose somebody out there is somewhere, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick to the uh, keyboard. <laughs> I got an email from somebody about 10 days ago, sun's out a couple weeks ago, I guess. And this guy was down at the beaches in Toronto, stumbles across, uh, almost stumbles across, I guess, uh, an old a performer friend of mine from 20, 25 years ago, a juggler, who's now doing a dual, uh, guitar act. And there he is. <laughs> Still out on the street. Well, I know. I've been to Key West, you know, and I've seen some of those guys work. There's a guy down there with a trained cat show, uh, and you know, he he gathers them in, and it's amazing. You know, yeah, turns these, that tip. Yeah, yeah, these guys have a gift. I remember uh, working at Harper's, and this guy would come in with his Crown Royal bag, and would lit, you know turn it upside down, and bam, right on the table in the make in the in the in the dressing room boom and his change and his bills and this was before our loonies and toonies and he'd count it all up and he'd be into three four five hundred dollars cash on a friday night um well, you know, not, bad. He, not bad at all that's back in the uh back in the 80s um i wonder too gabe you know i just before we head into that i want to talk more about you know this move into auctioneering and 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 uh, some of the links there but uh, and also about um, why the magic community doesn't hate you because you've given away all these secrets and mysterious <laughs> encyclopedia. <laughs> um, but but um, these guys were all nuts, weren't they? Like you know, uh, when you look at the vaudevillians, I mean, the the couple stories I've I've read from Steinmeier about some of the the, the history of some of the, the the way they went around stealing tricks from each other, and the way they, I mean, they just tried to undermine each other. Massive egos, the the affairs that just, I mean, they, they a lot of them died in debt and so on. I mean, wh- any idea what's going on there? And is that a fair assessment? Human nature, I would say. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, they're in a in a business where. Perhaps you know feeding their ego and publicity and selling tickets is the most are the most important things. So I can't say that I'm surprised, but I would also say that you know for as many people as get written about in books that you know are <laughs> written to be sold and entertain you and keep right. you kind of interested. You know there are guys like Nate Leipzig and you know others who probably led slightly less sensational lives. Right. But were successful and entertaining and, you know, sold tickets and made a living in the theater. 
Well, you know, I, I was not familiar with your book on Laurent and just doing a little tiny bit of research on you came across it and I just kind of smiled and thought, wow, for all the Thurstons and the Kellers and the Dantes, how many guys were there like Laurent? Maybe not many like him exactly, but how many other magicians out there, you know, working in rural America, rural Canada oh, yeah. and the UK and so on. Um, it's, it is a pretty incredible, uh, uh, incredible piece of history. I mean, and I'm sure it's true of, you know, singers and right. bell ringers and orators and, you know, uh, artists and, you know, all that kind of stuff. People who really, you know, filled in that middle ground and, you know, did a very admirable job of it. So you, you've published a fair bit, and I, I heard uh, on Magic and written a fair bit, and I heard somewhere not long ago that in the variety arts, in Mag- there's probably more books published in Magic than there are in any other variety art. Is that true? Probably. I haven't done a scientific study of <laughs> right. it, but based on the amount of books that I've handled and you know the amount that passed through my hands uh, in you know, the auction business and you know, publishing and things, it's not far off. You know, I, I'd say, I'd, I would safely say top five, maybe, you know, top ten if you want to be cautious, but it's got to be right up there. Would these be, uh, would these be history books? Would the, or would no, these be... no, they'd be, it'd have to be instructional and history. Right. And now, and now, of course, we've moved into the whole um, DVD, YouTube-like kind of downloadable book uh, mm-hmm. as well, which has just opened up so many doors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't gone through any of those, but, uh, you know, plenty of people have. Uh, it's just not a medium I'm I'm comfortable with. I've kind of, you know, I dipped my toe in the water and found out it was a little too cold for me, so I just figure other, <laughs> other people should probably swim in that pool, not me. Are you, are you a bit of an old fart, Gabe, in the sense of, you know, auctioneer? Sounds like you've got to be an old guy to be an auctioneer to me. Well, I mean, that's where the scholarship thing comes in. Yeah, yep. you know, part of the Part of the enjoyment, honestly, is, figuring out what this thing is, uh, you know, why it's important, and then telling other people about it. Do you wear, like, so, um, do you wear like uh, plaid slippers and smoke a pipe? Uh, no, I can't say that I do. More like flip, flip-flops flip and, uh, you know, a glass of water. But, uh, uh, no, I, you know, like two weeks ago I was in uh, out east and I was packing up a collection uh, in a guy's house, and there's just mounds and mounds of stuff. It's like a hoarder situation. <laughs> right. And I, I've been in plenty of those, and I, I find it, I find it gratifying to go through a pile of stuff like that. You know, once I've kind of gotten over the nastiness of it, and pull out that one piece of paper that had some sort of historical significance, or you know, find a piece here and a piece there. One's on the third floor, and one's in a desk drawer on the second floor, and you know, one's in the garbage, and you put all three of them together, and it makes the complete object, which you then you know say, hey, look, this is really something neat, or, you know, it was used by this guy, or it's never been built this way before, or, man, look at the craftsmanship, or, boy, you know, the poster, you know, has been restored to its former glory. Imagine how this looked on the side of a building, you know, or it's the only example known, or, you know, things like that. that's, That's a really interesting way to marry the things we were talking about before, you know, scholarship and yeah, writing, yeah. Uh, love of the subject matter. What's kind of cool to me about that is, is I was going to say to you, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you before we wrapped up was, you know, how many more books do you have in you and, and, and what are you thinking about writing about? But as you tell, talk about this hoarder uh, of magic uh, memorabilia, I mean, think of the stories there, right? I mean, oh, you, yeah. you know, oh, you're yeah. probably not going to write a bio ab- about this particular person, but you could. And you could probably well, make it really no. interesting, right? What, and what I've done, um, although I'm not up to date on it, is because that's that's actually not a unique story. I've started keeping a little, you know, journal um, on and off. Mm-hmm. Usually, when I get delayed at an airport somewhere, right. I update it um, of all these experiences. Because inevitably, you know, on this this trip to pack up this thing something happened, but on, on right. another one, right. you know, something, you know, and I, and, and anecdotes abound. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I bet know, they so, do. Yeah, maybe there's a, there's a book there. Well, I mean, oh, you know, not to be too sexist here, but most of these guy collections would be men, I would think, that own these things, and do you ever all get, of them. Yeah, yeah, all of them. Do you ever get a chance to talk with their daughters or their wives or their uh, partners or whatever to, to, to get a side to them that you might not get from their dusty collectibles? Sometimes, you know, and definitely families, uh, kids, uh, you know, 
you know, and sometimes, now I'm not only dealing with uh, people, you know, the question of people who are deceased, sometimes it's people who simply want to right. spin the herd or, or whatever, but yes, very often it's with the states and, and things like that. Sure. And it's interesting to hear the relationships uh, of other people to this stuff or lack thereof or, you know, re- their relationships with their families or lack thereof. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it certainly changed my outlook on collecting and uh, at, 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 what, what it means and the kind of enjoyment you get out of it. Yeah. G- Gabe, does it change your outlook on people at all? I mean, I know that's kind of a corny question maybe mm. in some regards, but how, I mean... How do you mean? How do you mean? I don't know. You know, you're, you're looking at... Um, you're looking at all this, I don't know, stuff, this guy who's uh, moved on. Maybe you know a little bit about his history. Uh, he died recently. His wife's hobbling together some of his, you know, last little bits of business that uh, it were incredibly important to him that she's selling off. And, you know, any insights into, I don't know, insights into human nature? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, let's go real cliche. What is it? What's the line of the U2 song, All That You Can't Leave Behind? So, you know, oh, here's all this, right, right, here's right. all this literally shit, basically, that, that's, this guy's left, you know, <laughs> I don't know, just, just, uh, just You wondering. can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. That is true. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, I have found that there are a couple, couple, maybe three different types of collectors. For Inter- example, interesting guy who's very organized. Oh, yes. Yep. Um, and it's all not only in its right place, but it's all cataloged on you know, a database or on file cards or whatever. Some of them to the point of they're updating the values on the thing. <laughs> wow, cool. You know, sold at funny. auction in, in you know, 1970 for this amount, and then in 1974 for this amount, and then 1980. I mean, really down to the last detail. Um, and then there there's the opposite side of the spectrum, which is the hoarder, where... You know, it's literally piles of stuff, and it's yeah. garbage mixed in with gold. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Uh, there was one house I went through in Ohio, and the person that I bought the, the collection from said that when he went in, it was literally trashed. And he would start digging, and he'd pick up a bag, and it would have postcards. Like, uh, this was a college professor, and he and his wife would go on trips to Europe. Mm-hmm. Well. They saved all the maps from London and all the postcards they bought in London and the, you know, the bill from the hotel and all went in the bag. Well, at the bottom of the bag, he'd very often find the rare pure silver or pure gold coins that they bought at the coin shop that they visited <laughs> when they went on these trips. Oh, that's awesome. He found $150,000 oh, you got to be kidding. in gold and oh, silver oh, that's in amazing. bags all over the house. In this one house? In bags all over the house, but it was piled in bags, which were piled with other trash, with old newspapers, and, you know, and this was long before I got in there, which was just to take the magic stuff, you know, wow. I wish I'd been able to yeah, take no, the point, but, no, you know. no kidding, we call that, not, that's not collateral damage, I don't know what that is, but it's collateral something. Yeah. Collateral asset, I guess. Oh, that's cool. I love yeah. your phrase, garbage mixed in with the gold. That's going to be the, yeah. the title of my autobiography, I think. <laughs> I think I'm I'm not a hoarder because I don't have that much, but if you if you saw my collection, which is laughable, um, you'd find four things behind glass and then everything else in boxes. And I'll, I go through these, I would say, semi-annual moments of clarity where I'm going to organize everything. Mm-hmm. Never pans out for me very well, Okay. Yeah, no, I'm 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 right there with you. I'm trying to do it myself. What are the other types of collectors? So you got organized. You got those are, those are kind of the two. Those, those are, are two. kind of the two, and then there's something in between where it's organized chaos. You right. know where right. they know where everything is. Right. And it's it's livable, but it's right. you know just barely. Do you know what it sounds like to me? Is it sounds like so many of those professors' offices at their homes that I've gone to to have you know to chat or to work on a paper or to talk or whatever, and you walk in and you can smell the dust and the cigarette smoke and the piles mm-hmm. of books and you can barely see oh, them, yeah. right? For all, oh yeah, for all the stuff, it's quite charming in its own way. So. Um, I know uh, I have looked over so many magic books looking for the perfect one, and I think, quote, that Mysterios may be the best. It has a wide array of effects, and while classics are shared, so are lesser-known tricks. There's easy-to-understand illustrations, and it's all written up with knowledge. Oh, this is very nice, Gabe, quote, and affection, close quote. That's from uh, <laughs> Celia Zietzberger. Uh, she reviewed your book a little while ago, gave it five stars. Oh, hang on. 
five stars and then some. Wow. So I well, know. Come on. Get that's, her address. I want to send her a card. No kidding. That should be on your website. So that's so so you wrote this book a couple years ago, Mysterious Encyclopedia of Magic and Conjuring, a complete compendium of astonishing illusions. Tell me why you wanted to do it, I think, but I think I'm more interested in how come, I mean, maybe you did get some criticism leveled at you, but tell me about that within the magic community, because I thought it was all about secrets. Um, I think anybody that thinks it's all about secrets is an idiot. <laughs> um, there's the, there's why, the sound bite, I, by the way. Why did I do it? Oh, thank you. What? What's that? That's the sound bite, Gabe. Anyone oh, who thinks it's all about secrets is an idiot. Yeah, I I think so. <laughs> um, why did I do it for the paycheck? Not really. No. Uh, well, listen. If this person says you wrote it with affection, I doubt it. I, I, well, for the subject, no question about yeah. it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was an opportunity to do something for a major publisher. They did the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, Mother New York Times best-selling, you know, books. Um, it was an opportunity to have. Uh, you know, uh, a shot to do a real good introductory book, you know, mm-hmm. something that, mm-hmm. you know, that's how I got pushed along the path, shall we say. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. here was my opportunity to kind of put that back out there. Sure, sure, share it with others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So are, are your, some, they, they approached me, I mean, it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah. 2008 or 2009. 2008, it's still, yeah. still out there, yeah. Um, I'm sorry to say that I don't own it. I am going to try to track it down. Um, half price books, my friend. Half price books. Oh, is that right? Yeah, like a book. Uh, I, I think somebody told me that the uh, one edition is in in uh, some discount stores, so okay. it's it's pretty affordable. I think it was only a twenty five dollar book right. when it was released. Are, are some of your favorites in there? Absolutely. Stuff yeah. that I not uh, not that I perform that often, but definitely things that I do. Stuff that you actually uh, perform, but also maybe pulled you in? I mean, that, that first trick that you saw way back when? Uh, you know, or things that I learned early on. Oh, I see. I okay. Yeah. Really, really gave me a little confidence boost when I was able to perform them for other people and get a some sort of reaction. Definitely. So was... I mean, because... Go ahead. I was going to say, was Mysterio, was Mysterio a real guy? No, no. This was a conceit that the publisher came up with. Neat. They had... Uh, they had another item on the market. It was a, a, a trick deck of cards with a little instruction book, and it was uh, and this Mysterio character was created as a thread to, to teach the way teach the readers how to use this trick deck of cards. And they had a lot of success with it. And they said, well, "Hey, let's do a book." Cool. You yeah. know, but sure. who, who are we going to get to do the book? And so somehow they they got a hold of me. I, I got to tell you, I watch a magician today after having, you know, played around with it and read about it and performed for many, many years over, I guess, in my 40th year now. And if I see somebody do something well, it's still, wow, just, <laughs> I love it. Blows, yeah. blows me away. Uh, I'm, totally. I'm, you know, it's really quite remarkable. I, and I'd like to think there's something about that that's philosophical that appeals to this, I don't know, this idealistic side in us all, this wonder, this childlike sense that the world is, can be a better place, you know? I don't mm-hmm. know. I know it sounds, again, really kind of trite and corny, but I think it's part of the reason why I've been so drawn to it. And, you know, all philosophy begins in wonder, for heaven's sakes. Everybody said that, you know, Plato, mm-hmm. Aristotle, Bacon, Descartes, they all said it. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, so I think for me, there's a, there's a really cool thread. I, I still don't feel like I've hit the thread with you, Gabe, on, on w- what, what it is about all this stuff that kind of brings it all together. That's not necessarily that important, but I do want to talk to you a bit, a bit about, um, just before we hit the auctioneering stuff is, uh, your fascination with gambling. You've also, oh. yeah, I mean, obviously connected to magic, uh, and this whole idea of deception. Um, you wrote a book on gambling, did you not? No, I don't think I did. Oh, did sorry. I? No, not gambling. Um, I'm, what book am I thinking of? Uh, sorry, not gambling. Card forcing. Oh, yeah. That, that was, an, again, an introductory level thing about how to basically, you know, secretly exert your influence over people and, you know, make them take, take a card. Yeah, that's, that's something I did at, a, at another job, um, but I did write a few books for them. Again, introductory level things that, you know, hopefully kids will... Um, be able to use, learn from, and use, and kind of start them on that path. 
So I, I, I haven't punched it up here, but I remember the title. I looked at it a few days ago. Was it something to the effect of card forcing techniques and other uses? I don't remember. Okay, okay, because okay, I laughed out loud when I saw that um, uh, because uh, card forcing techniques and other other uses. Just like Gabe, what were you thinking of? What? Do you remember the story about Ted Anneman? Uh, about how he used to try to sell extra copies of some of his books. He had a book called, he yeah. had a book called 202 Methods of Forcing. Okay. Uh, and that was it. It didn't say, it wasn't forcing cards or anything. It was 202 Methods of Forcing. Well, he used to do these, uh, take out ads in men's magazines back in the 30s once these books had been published. And... Uh, the ads would be very kind of equivocal with their language. They would say, learn how to exert your influence. And, you know, the implication was that you would either be able to pick up women or hypnotize them. Right, to, right. You know, in fact, if somebody sent him the dollar and, and placed the order, he would just mail them a copy of the book on card forces. Right. You know, um, that's the only that's the only parallel story I can think Well, and you get a thousand people doing that, that's a thousand bucks, Right. Something tells me it didn't work out that quite that well for <laughs> that right. animal, but uh, That's right. you know, some people took him to task for for that, and uh, it's kind of become a, a story that you know gets repeated about him. Well, there's definitely a connection there. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, there's lots of connections, but this whole idea of cheating, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, gamble your 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 auction coming up in the next week or so. Is it is it uh, ma- ma- magical memorabilia or is it a bit of a mix? no? No, it's uh, it's gambling memorabilia, so we've got, uh, you know, things used in the Old West, like uh, barrel card tables and card presses and things used to trim and and round cards and cheating devices used to switch cards in and out of play. Uh, We've got one table that's got a concealed electromagnet that was used to hustle uh, dice games. And then on top of that, we've got um, really the the main stuff in the auction, if I'm honest, is rare playing cards. So we have decks dating back to the 18th century, uh, tarot cards from Europe, things like that. We've also got a deck hand painted by Apache Indians on rawhide. Wow. We've got uh, cool. you know, early American decks, advertising decks, things like that. And then all kinds of associated memorabilia, posters and things related to all the manufacturers going back to the 19th century. We even have a lot of porcelain with the playing card motif. Um, it's a big two-day auction, and um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, it sounds kind of very pushing cool. Us, pushing us outside the magic field a little bit, and um, our first big two-day auction. I, it's I've I've been to a few auctions, mostly livestock, <laughs> um, but, <it's, laughs> but you know what? It's pretty fun to watch. Um, I would yeah. I would love to sit in on one where you're you're auctioning off cheating devices. I mean that's pretty cool. I mean this whole idea of I don't know. It just it sounds like it would bring in a pretty interesting demographic. Uh, yes, yes. Last year we do this about once a year. Oh okay. Last year last year it was about I felt like it was like a cheaters convention <laughs> at our auction gallery. Uh, a lot of guys did show up who were interested in those things who. May or may not, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they were using them for entertainment purposes only. Right. But, uh, <laughs> right. Do you have to, do they have to sign waivers? Uh, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're selling the stuff as antiques or as Right, right. And, uh, you know, honestly, most of the stuff, you know, it's not, uh, you know, for example, uh, we have some crooked dice in the auction. Well, most of those things, uh, they would barely work or they're stamped with logos of casinos that don't exist anymore right. or right. things like that. Yeah, sure. So, so were there that many people cheating 150 years ago? Well, it's hard to know. I'm I'm not the expert, but uh, I would imagine you know that people have been cheating at cards and dice as long as there have been cards and dice. You know, so we're talking about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. No, I I would imagine. Sounds pretty sophisticated to me. It sounds like there was a lot of thinking going on about how to uh, dupe other people. It's amazing, right? I mean, that somebody would work so hard to do something nefarious when they could just get a regular job. <laughs> right. You know, That's a friend so of mine. Funny. Friend of mine had a had a had a, a friend of mine who actually lives in Las Vegas and does some casino game protection work. Had a friend who was a cheater, uh, and the guy was a very good card man, uh, but he he would cheat at anything, uh, slot machines. He even went, I think, to to jail for cheating. Uh, in, at slots, and the guy's line was, I have to commit 
X number of felonies a day just to keep my family fed, you know? Wow. I mean, just how he lived. Yeah. It was just how he lived. Just, just the way of life. So, so, uh, I, I played cards with, um, I don't play cards occasionally with my kids now, uh, played a game of poker or two, uh, many years ago and it was penny poker, I guess, or quarter poker. And it was New Year's uh-huh. Eve and out came the cards and, Hey Dave, do you want to play? And, uh, nobody, well, I guess at the time, a couple of people knew that I was a magician, but it didn't come up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I sort of, ah, you know, guys, I don't really play cards. In fact, the first time I've ever played with money. So, you know, maybe by the end of the evening, it was 15 or 20 bucks people were in for or something like that. It was no big deal, but I have to say it made it way more interesting, mm-hmm. um, from the times that I played cards before my desire to cheat went up without mm-hmm. a doubt, without a doubt. And once people found out that I was a magician, the assumption was period that I'd been cheating. Oh, and by the way, I kind of won. So hi, hang on, hang on. So let me get this straight. You've never played cards before, but you're a magician. Oh, sure. Nice. Right. And it was the big joke and it was fine. And it was New Year's Eve and there was no bad blood or anything. It wasn't like rounders, you know, Ed Norton and yeah, Matt Damon. Yeah. But, but yeah, Gabe, I wanted to cheat. I had a little bit of knowledge. I probably could have done a thing or two, but, the, but, but for me, the other lesson was it's really hard to cheat. Oh yeah. Like oh, yeah. really yeah. hard to cheat well. You know? Well, it depends. You know, a lot of these guys, from what I've been told, they only cheat in one way. Mm. So maybe a guy is very good at switching decks. Oh, I see. Okay. That's really all he does. So he really refines that skill set, and that's what he does. That right. is one thing. Maybe this guy is really good at marking the cards while they're in play. Right. And that's his skill set. You know, maybe this guy is just a dice man, you know, and he's right. good at either switching dice or controlling the dice as he throws them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so th- there's all, and then of course there's ways to cheat which aren't actually in the game, you know, in other words, uh, stealing uh, chips or checks off the table or stealing money off the pile. Sure, the, sure. The, you know, casual game. Which all um, kind of have magical sort of sleight of hand principles tied to them. Sure, yeah. sure. And then the other thing that uh, your story reminds me of is the old line about the magician playing cards, you know, if I don't win, they assume I'm a lousy magician. And if I do win, they assume I'm cheating. Right. You know, so you're screwed one way or the other. You're day. screwed either way, yeah. So, Gabe, we got to wrap it up shortly, but, um, and I would, uh, we could easily talk for two more hours without missing a beat. Um, <laughs> um, 2,500, 3,500 years ago, would you have been auctioning off the slaves and women? Oh... That's unfair. <laughs> uh, no, so, no, that's absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm doing I'm doing this because of uh, a love of the subject. It's the love of the subject. It's so Pl- cool. Plain, plain and simple. Plain and simple. That's how I ended up stumbling into the, the career in the first place. So, so yeah, can we talk about that just for a couple of seconds? Because it's such a weird. Like you don't, you don't. I don't think you go to school to become an auctioneer. I don't. You th- can. So oh, you, oh, a different kind of auctioneer. Yeah. Th- different kind of auctioneer yeah um did you like did it kind of was it one of those you know the dominoes falling was it that phone call from an old lady who wanted you to get rid of all this junk that her husband had collected it was uh, jay marshall actually oh okay yeah when jay passed away a friend of mine uh, and for those who don't know who we're talking about he was the dean of american magicians um and had one of the world's most incredible collections of antique magic uh gambling memorabilia, ventriloquist stuff, a quarter of a million books in, in his on his property. What? So, well, yeah, when Jay died, uh, and I had known him in the last five years of his life, um, a friend, a mutual friend, uh, was named in, in Will as the person to figure out what to do with all the stuff. Sure. All, all the magic-related stuff. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you wrapped your head around the fact that he had a quarter of a million books, and it was all mixed together oh, in three buildings... Imagine buying everything you ever wanted for eight years and just throwing it over your shoulder into a pile. And that, that's kind of what he did? There was a path in the kitchen with piles on either side, and you just had to walk through the... You know, just, <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Tell me you got photos of that. Uh, I, I think we have... Yeah, I have photos. Oh, you know what, you know what where, my, where, where my image went immediately was... Um, um, uh, oh, come on. Uh, Citizen Kane, Kubla Khan, you know? The... the uh. <laughs> You know, where he had all that stuff at the end, where they're where they're throwing it in the fire. You know, uh, you know. Actually, I don't remember that scene, but this was 
this was epic. Yeah, it sounds uh, like it. So I, I was hired to do, uh, to work on that for six months, and at the conclusion, uh, this is the extremely condensed version of the story, at yeah. the conclusion of our appraisal and figuring all the stuff out, we had all this material left over, we donated a bunch to a museum, uh, we said to the attorney in charge of the estate, you know what, you should really have an auction of the stuff that's left. And so we did, and we organized it, and that started the snowball, the proverbial snowball. The proverbial right snowball. It's pretty cool, eh? I mean, the, yeah. when you look back, I mean, I've, I I love quoting the old Kierkegaard line about you, know, you just you, you live your life moving forward, you take the steps, you make the choices, and it's not till years later that you kind of look back and you see all the connections. And, well, uh, and and it's totally been that way. That was in two thousand eight, and and I I've, I've already been able to look back and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the company is Potter and Potter Auctions. Mm hmm. And is that Potter and Potter Auctions dot com? Potter Auctions dot com. Potter Auctions dot com. Uh, check it out for those of you who are listening and um, look into Gabe Fajuri. Uh, F A J U R I is uh, how to spell Gabe's uh, last name. He's got several books online, and you really do have to check him out on YouTube before he takes it down. He is quite the dashing young man um, living I'll never in Chicago. Forgive you. That's right. You'll never forgive me, Gabe. Thanks a lot. I, I you know, clearly once again. Uh, uh, you know, every guest I interview uh, just reminds me there's so much more going on than meets the eye, and that's that's absolutely brilliant. So thanks for sharing your time today. Thanks for having me, David.